Welcome everyone to episode 54 of the Brandon Adams podcast. I have with me Daniel Negranu. Daniel is probably the most famous poker player on the planet right now, possibly with the exception of his rival, Phil Hellmuth. He is currently off a victory in the $300,000 buy-in, super high roller bowl. Really, that's why I wanted to talk with you today, Daniel, because I find your resiliency so impressive and so amazing. Um, when when you have a downturn, they seem never to last very long. And you uh, you always pop up in this fashion. It's so very impressive. I, I recently had a podcast with with um with Jungle Man where your your name came up as the player that he respects the most or among the most. And um I was recently looking at the list of the top 10 players in WSOP for the past decade. You're currently number two. I would imagine in the decade before that, you would have been one or two. Uh, how did that victory feel a couple of weeks ago? It felt really good because I sort of tapped into a lot of the strengths. I was Poker Masters leads up to super high rollable. So I was testing some new things out, some theories that I was you know, thinking outside the box with, and a lot of them essentially going back to some old school stuff that I did, which is a lot of table talk, a lot of unique dynamics, like limping, larger raises, all things that the majority of people who study, uh, you know, with solvers, they don't know anything about, like nobody studies hundred big blind limp strategies, right? So I was using strategies that were pretty alien, I think, to my opponents. And it felt really good to see it pay off. I felt like in the super high roller bowl, from start to finish, I was in complete control, never in doubt, never at risk, never all in at one, any point um, and avoiding any sort of real you know, damage to my stack. And it felt like without question, it was the most dominant performance I've ever had in my whole career, considering of course, you know, who the opponents are too, right? You're not dealing with blind people, you're dealing with like, you know, high level thinkers. So I see some parallels to the uh, uh, Galfond challenge here where Galfond, when he decided to take on many opponents in a row. He dedicated himself to GTO study of, of heads up PLO. And then he promptly went down $2 million in his first match. And he took a pause and reevaluated and decided that he needed to go back to his foundations a little bit, his natural way of play. Um, and then what he ended up with is sort of... <clears throat> Uh, his normal play as a baseline, but having been flavored by his GTO study, and it sounds like you've undergone something similar. You had the uh, the period of coaching with, um, you might remind me your of your coach's name, and then maybe you decided to go back to the roots a little bit and the mix has suited you. Yeah, so it's a good way to describe it really, but ultimately I think like, Solvers are an incredibly useful tool and learning theory at a high level is very valuable in terms of understanding how the game works really, right? Um, but it's used, it should be used as a baseline, right? So what happens is most humans, they're trying to replicate computer outputs that no human brain will ever do. It's impossible. You can try as much as you want, but you're always gonna have tendencies because the way it works is the solvers do have all the answers, but you have to ask the most in-depth questions. The questions that people ask are, what should I do here? Should I bet one third pot, two thirds pot, or one and a half pot? That's it. That's three. They're limited to sort of three basic sizes. Where a solver, they might have limps, they might have four X pot, two X pot, nine X pot. Like they're going to do all these different things through an exploitation. So what I think, what I learned really through theory was I found some holes in it specifically in tournaments in terms of the way humans are interpreting the data, right? The data is not wrong. Right, but the way that humans are interpreting it is, and so not not completely. But, you know, there's a lot of stuff that's of value. But like I said, there's certain things that I found I could exploit specifically because the majority of my opponents are so dialed into essentially a similar one simplistic style of play. Not simplistic, I shouldn't say that, but um, one in which using different sizes, different angles, made it far more difficult for them because they didn't really have the answers for it. Well, you're just off an appearance on the Lex Friedman podcast, which was astonishingly good, by the way. You talked 
to every level of poker player from the the most advanced to the uh the never played poker never seen a, a poker hand and it was it was very very well done one thing you said that really struck me in that podcast is that uh the GTO school it almost can't be right all the time because if you consider the situation of playing day one in the main event with a table of players that you've never played with and will likely never play with again, um, it would be quite odd to play sort of a steady state best response to best response strategy. It has to be better for someone as experienced as yourself to play a purely exploitive strategy. And um, the idea of having balanced bluffing ranges, especially in the biggest spots, doesn't make a lot of sense because you're never going to play with them again. You're absolutely, you know, you hit the nail on the head, right? So as I said, you know, it's really valuable to learn theory, but let's use an example. And I was sort of having this one with Jason Kuhn, right? Ex exploitation works like this. It's essentially whatever you're doing that's outside of the norm of, of game theory, they're not exploiting, they're not doing anything about it, right? So for example, let's say a flop comes out and the GTO size chooses 25% pot, right? That's the GTO size. It's accepted. It's, it's accurate, right? What if you did this? What if you use 25% with your bluffs and 40% with your value? If your opponents react the same way to 40% and 25%, you're just printing EV. Now, obviously, if I did that, people would be like, hey, wait a minute. When he bets 25%, he's bluffing. When he's betting 40%, he has it. And obviously, that would take a long, long-term data to know, right? And if you're playing, say, in the World Series book or main event, you don't show your whole cards unless you're me on, the, on one of the feature tables. So nobody knows what you're doing. They don't know if your 40% size is always value or always bluffs unless they see all the hands. And when they do, you can always make that adjustment. So the point being is that, you know, if you try to play a strategy that is game theory optimal, you're trying to avoid being exploited by not exploiting, right? You can choose, if you have a weaker mind, a weaker player, you can choose to be like, no, I need to be balanced against this player. Or you can say, you know what? This guy always calls. I'm not bluffing him, period. Forget about theory, forget about anything. Everyone else at the table might know. Like, I remember a period in 2004 when all the pros would like roll their eyes. I'm like, I'm betting almost the full pot on the river. And all the pros are like, he's got the nuts, right? I'm like, you all know that. But the guy I'm playing has no idea. So you can roll your eyes and say, well, we know Daniel has quads and he's such a fish, but like the guy called me because I wasn't playing against you, if that makes sense. It, it absolutely makes sense. And I also think another problem is that someone like you, who's quite read based in their play, every once in a while, you just have to get deep in a hand with like the Jack four offsuit that you should never have, right? Or, just, or make some serious diversions. I did it recently. I just played this little Stormex Invitational the other day. And uh, I had a hand where, based on my stack size, a guy opened. I'm supposed to just put my chips in. I had ace-10, short stack. And that's it's the correct play, the GTO play, right? And, you know, a lot of people talk about mixing their three-bet strategies and stuff like that. And they do it randomly, right? Why not do it based on information, like you said, with live reads? This guy, went, he made a very clear tell where he was like, oh, um 30 and it was like okay buddy <laughs> you're trying to pretend you have nothing you have the nuts so i folded an ace 10 which might even actually even be a mix in that spot but i did it based on the situation the player and the physical read rather than you know what what new, new theory would teach is to just look at the clock and be like oh it's a 37 that means i have to you know raise this hand or bluff this hand and when you try to you know assimilate uh, um, you know, computer solver outputs, you're never going to be successful at it. And I, you're just leaving a lot of gravy out on the table. Like, I have no doubt that if a GTO solver played tournaments, they win, right? But I don't think they'd be the week biggest winner. I really don't. I think that the other players that would look to exploit are, are going to do even better than that. Now, in the Super High Roller Bowl, when you went back to old strategies, um, I also think an advantage is that you find some comfort because you have your whole previous experience base to work with. Whereas if you're following GTO lines and you say three bet a hand preflop that you would traditionally just call with, now you've you've thrown away your whole previous 
two decade long experience base of having called with that hand preflop. Yeah, no question. You know, um, like limping, for example, I've been limping for 30 years. Like I've, I've had that in my game and I, I found that it, it has an effect on the meta, which I'm always conscious of. I don't think enough, maybe younger players really even understand what meta is and how to affect it and how to change it and how to set it set up. So it's well suited for what you want to do and what you want to accomplish. And limping really helped me with that because I've, like you said, I've had 30 years experience doing that. My opponents don't. So they found themselves in a lot of tricky situations. Like, what am I supposed to do here with ace 10 suited in the small when a Granu limps the cutoff? Am I just supposed to four X? Am I supposed to five? Am I supposed to limp to just call? Like they don't have those answers because again, if you spend the vast majority of your time studying one thing, anyone who throws something new at them where they come from comfort, like you said, because I've been doing it. I know, I know how to balance my ranges in those spots where it's not like, oh, he limped. He must have king four suited. No, I've also got ace king, aces, queen jack suited, pocket nines, pocket tens. I have the wide variety of hands and I know how to implicit, just instinctively do that because as you said, all the experience. I love it. I want to go into the deep history a little bit. We're going to go sort of halfway back first and then I want to go all the way back. I want to go halfway back to when we played the second final table that I'd ever made, actually third I had ever made, uh, 2006 Tunica. That was a fun one. I want you to tell that story, A, because you won the tournament and uh, and B, because I sort of remember you telling a story about how that particular tournament was a key juncture in your career. I don't remember why, but maybe you could take us back to that time, 2006, January, okay. I believe, Tunica. Yeah, so that's funny because I was just talking about this with, with Brian, my agent, the other day. Right around that time, I'd started my own online poker site called Full Contact Poker, which was a skin in the Poker Room Network. Well, I was the only one funding it, so it was all my money. I was putting all my money into it, if you will. So Brian and the guys came to me and said, we're going to need another like 500K for marketing. And I was like, okay, um, what's, what's the next tournament on the schedule? And they're like, well, there's one this weekend in Tunica. All right, all right, I'll be right back. <laughs> so I fly to Tunica. I win like 786, put the 500K on the table. You know, and we, and we handled that, you know, there, but uh, that was like, that was kind of one of those like call your shot moments internally that we always sort of giggle about. But yeah, uh, I mean, obviously I would have been able to get the money anyway, but it was nice to just go pick it up in Tunica as, as, as planned. <laughs> that was, that was fun. That was a fun final table. That was back in the day when uh, the random circuit events in Tunica or, or New Orleans or Tahoe were a big deal and they had them on on TV and people cared about what happened. It was a different era. And you won 800K for winning a 10K. No. Um, okay, so take us all the way back. I want to know um, a little bit about the very first months and years in Vegas. And I want to know a lot about the original crew, which you say was uh, you, Alan Cunningham, Phil Ivey and John Yuanda. Yeah, well, if I go way, way back, right? I mean, in Toronto, I was playing on a very set schedule. I was very well organized. I kept the notes. I kept, you know, really good records. And I was playing $10, $20 limit hold'em. And I was very structured. I would play from noon to 8 p.m., five days a week, 40-hour weeks. I would never, I would, if, if, at 8 p.m., occasionally I would play a little bit longer, but with one stipulation, I had to be winning. If I was losing even $1, I had to quit at 8 p.m. to avoid some of the pitfalls, you know, a lot of poker players fall into. So I had it all structured and ready to go. Then I go out to Vegas with my bankroll, and my whole game plan just is out the window. And now I find myself sitting in a game for 24 hours with my case 3,000 and, like, losing it all. And going to the bathroom, it was like 3 a.m., wash my hands. I come out, and it was a seven-handed game. And it literally washed my hands and used the bathroom. The game was empty. Like, they'd all left. Like, and I was like, oh my God, I was the sucker. It was a Binion's horseshoe. I'm like, oh my God, that was really, really embarrassing. So well, whatever, it was like, a, you know, one of those moments where, you know, young kid, 21 years old, thinks he's hot shit, comes to Vegas, thinks he's going to take him down. Back to Toronto with my leg between my legs, several trips back and forth until I start to figure it out a little bit. And then I started to, uh, you know, play the tournament circuit. And I remember looking at the leaderboard at the LAPC and seeing my name up there and seeing another guy, John Juanda. And then there's another guy next to me looking up his name too. And I looked at him, he looked at me and he's like, is that you? I was like, is that you? He's like, yeah. So that's kind of <laughs> how we met, right? Um, Al and I met, uh, I think we were playing, I was, it was 8160 at the Commerce and he was very young to be playing those high stakes. 
And I sat in the game and I remember him thinking like, who's this young guy who has money to play in this? And I was thinking, who's this young guy who has money to play this, right? The final um, group in the quartet was Phil Ivey. And uh, we first met him, Alan met him first and he was in Atlantic City at the Taj Mahal. And, you know, Phil, Alan just said, you know, this guy's really good. He's good. He's going to be a good young player. And we're like, hey, what's up? You know, what's up, Phil? And then from there, you know, we were always finding ourselves in Foxwoods and Rio and we'd have dinners together. We'd talk strategy. And the way strategy typically worked was John, John Juwanda would be like, well, did you win the hand? Right. And we'd be like, no, the guy hit the queen on the river. was like, well, then you misplayed it. Like it was, it was just like that. Right. And Phil Ivey was always the wild one who's just playing way too many hands, just crazy. And I was more on the Phil Ivey side. And then Alan just was the one who had the answers. Like he just had the right answer. You know what I mean? He was just like, the, 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 what do you call it? Because John Juwanda thought if you lost three sessions in a row, you must have been playing bad. Because he'd run so pure, I think, up to that <laughs> point. But it was a nice little brain trust to have before anybody had solvers, before anyone had forums and groups where there was really high level thinking going on. We got to bounce hands off each other, right? And we helped each other, even though we all came at the game from a different perspective. I think it's a valuable way to learn still. You know, obviously, you know, there's much more advanced tools now, but the idea of having a group, you know, a group of friends who are all in the same group, you know, same, same sort of place in their poker career, bouncing ideas off each other. That's, that's a really good way for you guys to all grow together. I think. If you haven't uh, been to visit John Juanda in Tokyo, I recommend it. He, he said that I should hit him up when I went to Tokyo for my 40th birthday and I did, and it was fantastic. Yeah, no, I know. That's one of the things I, I, I'm probably going to do. It's on my bucket list to go check him out over there in Japan. So uh, those years when it was the three of you, what, what was that? Um, what, what were those years? I don't even, you know, so this is the thing about like time and years. Like I'm really bad at like remembering exactly when and what. Um, you know, I, I started out in the late 90s, you know, playing tournaments. And that's where all those guys sort of came into the picture right you know around 2000 ish or whatever um so i would say it was like right around those years and really what we were doing was playing really small tournaments you know 300 dollars buying 100 hundred dollar buying 200 buying and really gaining a lot of experience ivy sort of started to move towards cash games like i remember one month in foxwoods um he was he was playing stud and he lost his money and he asked me to borrow and i had forty thousand in my name he asked me for 20 i gave him it Gave him 20,000. So the next month we went to LA and he started playing one and 200 stud, right? By the end of the month, he's playing 500,000 stud and he's got, you know, a big bankroll once again. And, you know, he, that was, I was there every day too, but I was just playing these 200, $300 dinky tournaments. And he was in there, you know, actually grinding. And when he grinds, when he sets his mind to grinding hard, he's, you know, tough as nails. Now, what would you say like really pumped up the poker economy back in the day, because I I kind of remember around 2004, say in the summer in Vegas, uh, you would have some big games, but like it was it was notable if there was say a, a deep 100, 200 PLO, everyone would be like, wow, that's a massive game. And they would hang around watching. Um, and then all of a sudden, if you go to say 2006 or 2007, you've got 4,000, 8,000 limit and 500, 1,000 no limit PLO. Uh, there, was, there was a big inflation and it was more than just the moneymaker era. What, what were some of the things, like you mentioned the Ivy story, there was the, I guess the Larry Flynn hustler game that might've been an infusion pump pumped him up. Um, what did you see as, as driving the, uh, the poker boom back then at the high stakes? Well, you know, your timeline is definitely different than I recollect. And I think I'm accurate on this one because I would remember this one pretty well, but I was playing high stakes in the 2001, 2002. I was playing as high as 4,000, 8,000 back then mixed games with a 100. We had a one through 2000 blind, no limit with a 1000 Annie which is a really dumb game with a hundred K cap. It's like 50, it's like, just get it in. Like someone make it 10, next guy a hundred, you know, really stupid game. But I was playing those games before the WPT came around. Now the perfect storm, I think happened with that period of time, right? The first cog was rounders being filmed, 
Rounders didn't do great in the theaters when it first came out in 98. But then it became a cult classic. When more and more people start to watch it, you know, and certain people get into it. And that sort of spawned, like, there, there was the very grassroots, like, online poker, planet poker, paradise poker. Finally, you know, that's when the next wave of, you know, Ultimate Bet, Poker Stars, and then much later, Full Tilt sort of came on board. Um, but I think it was WPT, right, filming and, you know, showing the show on, on, the, on the Discovery Channel, which really brought No Limit Hold'em specifically to a new, new place because people didn't really play No Limit Hold'em in cash games. There's always limit. And then you couple that with like Moneymaker winning, you know, um, the, the World Series of Poker main event and seeing the numbers go from like 800 to 2,500, you just all of a sudden had a lot more people interested in poker, specifically No Limit. As far as the cash games go, I think a part of the influx was Andy Beal as well. Um, you know, you, you talked about the Larry Flint game, and that was obviously a spot where a lot of the guys who played stud did well. But when Andy Beal came to town, there was a group, corporation of people who all put their money up to play against them, and everybody got pumped up, you know, because they did pretty well against them. So now everybody has more money. Now everybody can play higher stakes with Lyle Berman and the like, you know? <laughs> yeah. Now, when did you start blogging? And, I, and I'm thinking right now, when you say that the high stakes had been around for a while to a, a, a blog post you had back in the day where Ivy looked at you and he said, you're about to pop your cherry, which in his terminology meant you were about to lose a million dollars for the first time in a cash game. And I remember it was 4K, 8K limit. Um, so two questions there. When did you decide to be public facing and start to do the blogging and all of that? And do you recollect this particular story and blog post? That story is awesome. Love it. Yeah. Blogging was something I started on card player. You know, they asked me to do, actually I was doing, I remember, I don't, it's so, I don't remember exactly the, you know, where I started. I started writing on forums and sort of, you know, creating a name there, but this, well, like this game you're talking about was a blast. Uh, we were in San Diego for some WPT thing, you know, like, or this, you know, small little tournament thing. And all the guys went, you know, Chip and Doyle and Johnny and, Gus and Ivy and myself, and we all, you know, played this thingy. And then cash games broke out. And I went in, you know, the first day we played 48,000. I won myself, I don't know, like four or 500,000. It's a decent win. Um, the next day we play and nobody has money, right? So we're playing, it's about 24 hours in and we're now down to three handed. It's Gus Hansen, Phil Ivy, and yours truly playing three handed, like eight game mix with Big Bet in there, right? The funniest part about it is we were playing with, one dollar chips playing four thousand eight thousand with one dollar chips where one dollar represented the thousand right so theoretically somebody could have went to the cage and snuck in like you know a couple of hundred and one dollar bills and made a score and then what we did was we played on a sheet you know so we were just tracking like who was winning and i remember you know after a couple of rounds of plo or something i was like phil ivy did look at me he's like you broke you broke you broke your cherry huh and i was like because i was stuck like 1.1 now the best part of that story for me was that, you know, we're playing high stakes, three-handed PLO. You know how that can go, right? With 100K cap. And I was able to scoop a big PLO pot, got all the way back, and poor Gussie, he ended up uh, taking the brunt of it because both uh, – I made it all the way back. I think I won 100, and then Phil won all the rest. <laughs> wow. Um, okay, so presumably back in the day, uh, that Millie, if the session had ended right there, down 1.1, that would have stung quite a bit. And so I ask you, how has your risk aversion changed over time? I mean, maybe you could estimate what fraction it was. I'm sure it was a high fraction. Uh, and I know that you would not risk comparable amounts today. Uh, what, what has changed? What changes in the, in the psychology when risk aversion kicks in? Yeah. So I think when you're young and you don't have a lot of stuff, right? You don't have, you know, you're not married, you don't have kids, you're in your twenties and you have a, a, say a mediocre bankroll or, you know, something small that's replaceable, right? When my younger days, I go broke all the time as a teenager, you know, 500, a thousand dollars would get me back on my feet, right? So it was replaceable. As you start to build an nest egg, you know, and 2004 came around and I started to see really what happened to some of my peers, you know, two in particular was like Huck Seed and Lee Salem. I found myself headed down that path as well in the year 2000. After 99, I um, built up a nice bankroll because I won the 
U.S. Poker Championship. I left Atlantic City with like 350000 in cash in a bag. And the whole year 2000, I just golfed, went to dinners, had dinner, drinks, and then we'd go play some poker, drunk. You know, by the end of the year, guess what? There was no money left, right? And I saw this pattern amongst some of my peers, and I realized, like, you know, I don't want to be doing that forever, right? So the next time I got a hold of money, um, I still had that gamble in me. But I think as you get older, you know, it doesn't, like, for example, I guess extreme examples, like, if you had $20 million, right? Having $25 million versus 20 is not going to change your life at all. I mean, you still live exactly the same way. Whereas if you're young and you have a $2,000 bankroll and all of a sudden you have 20 or 15, that's a, that opens up a whole new door for you. So on the come up on, as a youngster, I was always looking to get to the next level. I wanted to be able to reach that level and, and you know, live that lifestyle. And so that way in my thirties, like, I didn't have to work or didn't have to play poker. And once I did, you know, have enough financial stability, it just like doesn't excite me as much. Because I used to play games or whatever, like my entire bankroll is on the table. Lose this pot. If I lose this pot, I have to figure out who I can borrow money from. You know, my credit was good, but, you know, I didn't have it. So there was always that risk. And I, I just, as you get old, you don't want to be in those shoes anymore. So you mentioned that when you were younger, you had this discipline. You would record all your sessions in the notebook. You'd play till 8 p.m. You'd quit if you were down. And then you went through this undisciplined period. And it seems like you're in a highly disciplined regime now. Um, so is that is that your natural state, the highly disciplined regime, or or was it more the loose, the loose living in 2000 and you and you had to impose rules over time? You know, my natural state, and I'm, I'm, I'm at best, and I, you know, I tell Amanda this, if I'm, if I'm goal setting, if I'm looking to achieve something, if I'm physically training my body to get to some specific place, I'm always better off when I'm in a routine. I got caught up, frankly, in like Vegas, you know, it's easy to do. You go play poker, then you go have some drinks, you go to Spearmint Rhino, and now all of a sudden you wake up in the, like you leave the strip joint and it's like bright sun at 7 a.m. and you're like sleeping all day, drinking, living that life, like you know, I got tired of it. I didn't want to do it anymore, but I certainly, you know, that, that threw off my entire schedule, right? There was no sense of like, you know, structure. And that was part of what led to the year 2000 for me. What led to it was just, I had no structure. And I think one of the biggest mistakes a lot of young people make is this. The goal is when you're, when you have no money and you're starting, the goal is what? To make money, right? So that's what the, I want to make enough money. Okay. Now you've gotten there and you have the money. What next? right? If you have no foundation, you have no, no drive and you have nothing to do, often what you'll see is self-sabotage, right? So you'll see this guy who grinded up a big bankroll. Now he's got a million or two. Now he's drinking. He's got hookers on his lap, doing cocaine or whatever. Three days later, he's broke again. But guess what? His life now has purpose again. His life has purpose again. And the purpose is I have to go to work and make money. The worst thing that happened to him to a certain degree was achieving that goal, but the goal being faulty, right? I always ask people when they say like, well, I want to make a lot of money. I'm like, for what? What do you want the money for? Like get clear on the vision, right? The long-term vision of like, you know, I want money so I can have the freedom to travel. I want money so I can raise a family. I want to raise money so I can, you know, give money to charity, whatever. The case. But like if you have no end to it, once you get the money and you realize it's not, it's not what fulfills any hole in you. That is not, you know, the emotional plug that is like, ah, I was unhappy when I'm 20 and now I'm happy because I have 2 million. It doesn't work that way. I mean, I, I think you can understand that too as well. Yeah. So you described on the Lex Friedman podcast that you have a hyper competitive streak. You enjoy working very hard. And you've said in other interviews that you like to open the world series with uh, a Rocky Bonanza where you watch the entire Rocky series. Um, <clears throat> Is, is that still part of your routine, the Rocky series? Do you respect the uh, Creed series? I, I do. And has that, has that raw competitive drive gone anywhere as, as you've aged? So the Rocky um, tradition is still on each and every year. What's changed is it's taking a lot more time now because originally it was just, you know, the four Rockies and then they had Rocky five and then you got Rocky Balboa. So now there's, and now you got Creed and you've got Creed two and you've got Creed three coming out. So I'm going to watch them all every year. And I watch them throughout, you know, the series when I have time, but yeah, each one of the Rockies 
it just sounds silly to maybe some people, but they really do put me in a mindset and a reminder of where I want to be, you know, and the two specific ones would be Rocky three and Rocky four in Rocky three. He's the champ, you know, he's got it all figured out. He's out there, you know, doing interviews, he's doing commercials, he's taking pictures, you know, the girls are kissing him, all this. What's Clubber doing? Clubber Lang, sweating, grinding in a dirty ass gym. And what happens to Rocky? He gets his ass kicked because he got complacent, right? So I compare that to like, you know, the young online solver generation. You're like, all right, well, they're working their ass off. What am I doing? You know, I can't just rest on my laurels, right? And then Rocky IV, you know, Rocky is outmatched, you know, scientifically. You know, it's just the numbers are clear. Like Drago wins. Drago is a physical specimen on steroids, doing all the things. Rocky cannot win. He can't win, except he's human and so is the other guy. And he's got that extra competitive drive. He's got that will. He has that, uh, you know, no quit in him. And, you know, he, he finds a way, if you will. And so those two movies specifically really stick out for me in terms of like you know, relating to me in my life and how I can use them as like lessons for how I want to approach poker. Because one of the things with poker that I respect amongst any peers that, that do this is longevity, right? It's much easier to get to the top and be there for six months to a year than it is to consistently stay there and be able to adjust and adapt because you're always, you're always going to face younger people who are way hungrier than you. One of my favorite quotes was, uh, was a boxer who's wealthy already. And someone asked him the question. They said, you know, how do you do those 4 a.m. runs, you know, like after all this? And he's like, to be honest with you, it's a lot harder to do the 4 a.m. runs in silk pajamas, right? <laughs> like you think of Rocky doing them in this holy t-shirt, whatever. Once you become more sophisticated, um, you know, the grind like, I don't grind like I did in my early 20s. Like, they certainly have an advantage in that regard. There's no question. These guys grinding like that, they, they have an advantage there. But there's other wisdom-like advantages that I have that only come with years and years of experience. But you've, you've adapted as the competitive environment has become more fierce. On the one hand, there's the quality of play driven by solvers and other things. On the other hand... There's just the the competitive energy is much higher. If you compare it to 2005, when look, even at the highest level, the lifestyles were very loose and very bad, and it reflected in play at the poker table and endurance at the poker table and all those things. Um, and now, I I did one podcast with Sean Deeb, and in the past decade, he's number one. You're number two. He has a very extreme schedule. He plays every single tournament at the World Series. He uh, multi-enters. He is playing multiple tournaments at once most of the time. Uh, this is something that I really don't even think was conceivable for someone in 2005. Like maybe if there was a big side bet maybe it would happen for a short period of time, but Sean's doing this every year and you're right there with him. Uh, this is a, this is a new hyper competitive energy. Yeah, no, no question. Sean D plays like the biggest schedule. He plays way more events than I do because I really don't, I like you, what you mentioned about 2005 and not being feasible partly was because there just wasn't as many events. You know, you have now some world series days where there's three, four events and you have these, phases and heats and, and Sean's dropping a stack and all of them. like he plays all the small stuff Colossus you know these mini mirror I don't play any of them I just focus on the big stuff and I try to you know I'm playing something every day but as far as like you know the competitive aspect of it you have to find motivation internally I mean sure the Rocky movies help or whatever but I have to find that internally like the, the will and the want to do that because I don't need to do that it's certainly not about the money you know it's just about like, why do people play video games, right? So if you play a video game, you're trying to get to the next level or trying to get better at it and get to the boss man, right? Well, I'm playing a video game and I'm controlling myself. Like I'm a video game character. So I look at, you know, all-time money lists and I look at bracelets and different things. And I was like, all right, player of the year, let's try to win that, you know? And it, it's like, that's where I get joy. Like I always get joy out of the journey. I find that, say, during the World Series of Poker, I enjoy the grind. I love it, right? When it's all over, you're just dead, you know, exhausted and like you got nothing left. But like part of you is like, man, I wish we could go back tomorrow. <laughs> right? It's crazy. <laughs> football fans, join the next generation of fantasy football with Rainmakers Football. 
the first ever NFT fantasy game from DraftKings. It's the only NFT fantasy game licensed by the NFL Players Association. You can play all season for millions in prizes by building the ultimate NFT franchise. Playing Rainmakers is simple. Buy, sell, bid, and win player card NFTs of the biggest names in the game through regular drops and auctions on DraftKings Marketplace. Build your NFT franchise and enter free Rainmakers football contests all season long. You'll be competing for almost 30 million in prizes. Download the DraftKings Fantasy app and sign up with the promo code ADAMS. Click the Rainmakers tile and opt in to get your first card free. You will then be playing for millions in prizes all football season while building the ultimate NFT franchise. That's promo code ADAMS, build, play, and win only at DraftKings. So uh, you were explaining in the Lex podcast that you don't exercise, you don't watch the diet during the World Series, you gain 10, 12 pounds. You just try to focus on sleeping when you can and playing a lot of poker, simplify everything else in life, and then kind of play catch up in the month or two after. Yeah, well, if you look at Sean Deeb, for example, I don't think his World Series of Poker regimen includes, you know, Pilates, calisthenics, you know, weight training and cardio, right? Because there's no time, right? He's playing nonstop. And for me as well, um, I mean, I, we don't eat the same diet exactly, but... <laughs> For me as well, like, because I'm so invested in that, I've tried it. I've gone back and forth, like, you know, in the old, I would work out in the morning and go, but I found that like 1, 2 a.m. when I really needed all my faculties, waking up that extra hour or two early to work out, right? By, it, it actually affected me late in tournaments where I was drained. I just didn't have it, you know, because then I realized that like, above all, sleep is most important. So what I try to do going into the World Series is I try to go in in very good shape, right? So I go into the World Series in good shape, knowing that the next six weeks, my body can take it. It can, you know, gain a little bit. It can get a little softer and all those things. Um, and then I know that I, you know, I can game plan it and get back in shape, you know, quickly after that. But I found that if I'm going to do this right, the number one predictor of failure for me is not getting sleep. And I think that's an under, underestimated importance. Um, where your mind's at, if you're only getting five, six hours of sleep after three, four days, in these foggy situations, I mean, sure you can, you know, play what you think as well, but you just, it's very difficult to, you know what it's very difficult to do? It's very difficult to like have a short stack. You have seven big blinds left and you're exhausted, right? And be like, oh no, you know what? You gotta grind this nub. You're like, do I though? Do I? <laughs> can I just ship it in there and go to sleep? And that doesn't happen as much if you're like super engaged and super focused. You're like, I got seven bigs. We just got a double. We're back in this thing, right? If you're tired, you're like, Oh, fuck. Just give me an ace. Let me put it in. Come on. <laughs> so do you ever now in October in Vegas, like, want to go take on Bellagio 5K, 10K that's running right now? Just, just, I know your focus is crushing the tournaments and keeping the routine, keeping the healthy routine, but do you is there any element of the hyper competitive streak that says, you know what, I'm going to go crush that game for a few million. I'll be honest. Like I haven't had the appetite for it. I just haven't had the appetite. I mean, I used to obviously back in the early two thousands, you know, that's what I did was play mixed game cash for a living. Um, but for me, I'm, I live in extremes really. Like, as I mentioned, we talked about the world series of poker, very DJ, right. You know, playing nonstop, not working out, eating chocolate, eating sweets, whatever it takes. Right. Just total DJ, Right. But then when I'm not doing that, I'm totally the opposite. I'm in a routine. I'm waking up the same time, having coffee at the right time, doing all the things properly, right? Um, so then in, in that time, like if I were to go play at Bellagio and stuff, it disrupts it, you know? And I don't want, I, I have enough disruption, which is the World Series of Poker alone and a couple other series. F frankly, when I play the Poker Go series, I, I still maintain a pretty good health lifestyle because, you know, the days are sh not as long and, you know, it's it's a just nice and convenient. It's one tournament. So I'm able to like stick with that. But if I were to go play cash games with those guys, um, sometimes when you're in that world, like if you're playing high stakes, like five and 10,000, you're going to find yourself there at 9 a.m., you know, still playing from 7 p.m. the day before the day before. Like it's just, a, it's just the way that it, you know, the way that it essentially works at times. It's like, sometimes it's a, it's a, a battle of attrition in that like you have five guys who've all been up for two days and it's like, okay, all right, 
Who, who, can, who can hold up well enough? And then you're pissed when at 9 a.m. some guy walks in fresh, just had eight hours sleep. He's got his newspaper and his coffee. He's like, seat open. And you all look at him like, you know, are you fucking kidding me? <laughs> no, nah, bro. You can't come in here all fresh and clean and ready to go. Like, you, they should, you should get, get, out of our, get out of our face. <laughs> so you've mentioned that Ivy is, in your estimation, the best poker player and all the evidence seems to support that over the very long period um but who else is in your list of the of the night the nightmare opponent if it's a if it's a lock the doors 30 days 15 hours a day let's just say uh eight game mix let's just let's just suppose who, who else is on your list? Three or four guys. Yeah, well, there's obviously some names that I don't have a lot of experience with, but I respect my peers who, you know, have really good things to say about them. One would be Timofey, you know, another one would be like Michael Thuritz and those types, and I played a little with him. On, on a personal level, the guy that I would find really difficult to battle with shorthanded in eight game mix is Scott Seaver because he has a mind that like he figures out like new unique games. Like if you just decided, all right, we're going to play today, seven stud, nine or better. I'm like what? Okay, nine or better. Now he would, you know, he's Kim and Phil Ivy. They'll be able to adapt very quickly, you know, and, and, you know, be, a, you know, be able to think they've got just good poker minds. You know, they've got really good card sense in that way. They're not necessarily, you know, prototypical, like studied the spots, you know, they just, they have good feel if you will. So Scott would be up there on my list. Um, it's a whole bunch of guys. It's been a while since I played, like I said. Um, and when I started, you know, the big names of the time, they weren't really that good. Right. Like they, just, they were good comparatively, right? And so people always ask, like, well, you know, they sucked back then. I'm like, but Bob, I think it was Bobby Fisher who mentioned this. You know, he was asked, like, what do you think of the chess players from 100 years ago? And he's like, they're fantastic. He's like, you can't compare players of today to players of them because they had, they have, we have access to way more theoretical knowledge, right? So players today have all this theoretical knowledge that they got based on solvers stuff that if you drop them back into the year 1999, you don't have any of that. Okay, so you don't have any other knowledge. So how are you going to be good, right? So obviously, if you compare the two and put them in a game, you know the modern day players with, with theoretical knowledge are going to be better. But it's ink, it's apples and oranges, right? Because those guys, you think about Doyle Brunson and how he learned odds. He took a deck of cards and he would put ace king in one hand and sixes in the other, and he would deal out a flop, turn and river, and he would mark down on pen and paper. Oh, you know, after a couple hundred, ace king seemed to win about forty five percent of them. They did it like that manually, like that archaic. Whereas today, kids, boom, doing super advanced solves with the press of a button. It's funny with Seaver, when he showed up, you kind of knew he was going to be good. He showed up, he's 21 years old, coming from Brown or whatever at Cornell. And he, and uh, always articulate from day one, probably more articulate when he was 21 than he, than he is today. And, and, and you just knew that, his mind worked well with poker. You could see it from the, from the first weeks. And uh, it wasn't a surprise when it turned out he was around for a while. It's funny you mentioned Bobby Fisher. You've probably seen the material recently where they go back in, in games and compare the play to the move AI would make. And he's actually among the best. <laughs> right. That's amazing, right? So that's, that's interesting that you say that because I do think like a lot of the things that people learned using solvers and figuring out the right answers was stuff that I was already doing. Really, when I started to, you know, essentially create small ball, what tournament poker is today, isn't it? It's an extension of small ball, right? Across the board. And they've taken to a further extreme. Back in our day, when I grew up, nobody bet less than half pot on the flop as a C bet. There was no 20%, 25%. So there was none of that. People back then were opening for three, four, five X. I was min raising, you know, or, or close to it and stuff like that. So there's a lot of things. And there was another thing. I remember this theoretically when people used to laugh at me off of like 10 or 11 big blinds, you know, someone would raise and I would just defend with like nine, 10 off suit. And the theory was you got to raise or fold. You got to jam or fold. I'm like, why? One chip I can put in, right? See a flop. If I get a pair of tens, well, how exploited can I get? You know what I mean? I've only got eight big blinds left. If you can beat it, beat it. Right. So like just that alone, understanding that defending your big blind off short stacks rather than just going all in, you know, was more optimal, like stuff intu intuitively we learned, we figured out. It's not like these, you know, old school players didn't play within, um, you know, theory that 
was effective, right? It just, you know, now it's like provable by, you know, data for my AI. And some of it was behavioral, right? Like you think about super system, Doyle Brunson, if you, if you make a set, go ahead and bet out, right? Like it was, it was not logical, really. It's just behavioral. It was based on his long experience of what got the stacks. It was all, yeah, it's, it's all based on exploitation, right? Right. So he's doing, he's making these big bets with sets because he feels like when guys have over pairs, guess what? They, they, they call too often. They don't, they don't, they don't make folds. Right. So against, like, if you played against a player who has like tens plus and it comes eight, three deuce and you have a set bomb it, bomb, bomb, bomb. If they're not going to fold, just bomb, bomb, bomb. Right. Obviously today players are more sophisticated and they they'll fold some of those hands. If you did that, especially if you were imbalanced, but essentially what I figured out, you know, and everyone, and a lot of people is like, how to exploit small edges. One of the things that I remember doing is like on these, you know, boards like King seven deuce rainbow, right? It's a very dry board, right? People would typically bet, you know, almost the whole pot when they see bet. They're betting like 65s, at least two thirds pot. They're always betting on this flop. But I'm like, man, I'm going to be bluffing a lot, right? Because I raise a lot of pots and I'm in raise. I'm not going to have a good hand that often. So why don't I just give myself a better price? Right? Why don't I bet a little less? I'll bet like a little more than half pot, right? And found that, oh, you know what? Instead of betting 6,500 or 7,000, I can bet 4,500 and I can get away with it, right? So I was looking to cut corners. And that's how I went started to lower my raise sizes when I'm stealing the blinds. Instead of making it like, you know, 3X or two and a half, I'll be like, what if I go 2.4? And the question is, how much will my opponents adjust, right? So obviously, like say I hand like seven, eight offsuit. If someone opens for 10X, it's a fold. Everyone knows that, right? And if someone min raises, well, it's, you know, it's a call, right? It should be a call with the blinds and, you know, and the structure. The question is, where's the middle, right? So we know min raise is a call. We know 10x is a fold, right? But what about two and a half? What about three? What about four? Where is the line? And nobody really studies in that regard. Nobody has separate ranges for seven, eight offsuit against 2.2, 2.4, 3.5, 4.0. 4. Nobody does that, right? So they're just guesstimating. So part of what you know, an exploit could look like, and I've been doing this, frankly, because I, I know it causes problems, is I've been varying my open sizes, right? Now, if you figure out how I'm varying them and what I'm doing, you could exploit me. Good luck. <laughs> <laughs> Go for it. <laughs> so if you were told that you can't play poker for the next three years, and Amanda said, yeah, all right, you're limited to your uh, five five to 10 hours a week hanging out. How, how would you occupy your time? I'm limited to only spending five to 10 hours with her. Let's just say you got to fill, you got to fill your days. With I some can fill. Okay. So I'm, she, she, she's like amazed by this, but like, I, cause I'm before this we started, I was doing this. I could spend six to eight hours a day crunching hockey stats for my fantasy draft for my fantasy pool that I've been in since the late nineties. Absolutely love it. Right now, a more productive version of what day would include, and I haven't been doing this, is golf, going to the gym. So, like, say, for example, I could set it up where, you know, 10 a.m., I wake up, have breakfast, check the internet, see what's going on, go to the gym at noon, have lunch, you know, then go to the golf course for a day, watch the hockey games, maybe watch a show or two on Netflix or something like that. Like, frankly, I already sort of do that. <laughs> you know what I mean? Like, because, you know, when I'm not playing poker, I'm really not playing poker. I'm not in the lab. I'm not, I'm just like fully resting and relaxing. So to do it for three full years, I would imagine it would look a lot like that. And I would probably along the way, figure out new challenges and things that I wanted to improve upon. Like everyone's playing pickleball now. I don't know. Maybe I'd pick up pickleball. Like I'll figure something out and enjoy the process and the journey of improving on. It. Like even with golf, like I plan to get back to golf. Right. And I'm going to be terrible because I haven't golfed in like a year. Right. But that's okay. It's a new starting point. I'm not going to compare myself to when I shot like 80 from the back tees at Summerlin. I'm going to compare myself to yesterday or, you know, just to try to improve. So, okay, I can't break 100. Well, let's break 100. Let's get back to 95 and 90. So that, that challenge, that, that's like the juice of life for me. So I fully enjoy that. So if it wasn't poker that I was doing for three years, I would replace it with other passions for sure. So do you consider your mindset ADD with hyper focus or the opposite of ADD? It's hard to tell from the outside. Like, 
like I'm probably ADD with hyper focus. And I wouldn't know how to characterize you. Yeah, it's funny you say that because I remember we were watching, my wife and I were watching uh, Nick Shulman say like on the broadcast, he's like, because I was like all over the place. I'm talking, I'm this and that. He's like, I feel like Negron who has some sort of like, you know, uh, personality, borderline personality disorder. And my wife who studies this stuff, she's, you know, she's very, she's getting her psychology psychology degree. Um, She's like, you're not, there's, you're no traits of that, but you, she thinks I'm like ADHD because my mind like is all over the place. I, I, I don't know, right? I think with certain things, I'm definitely anal um, and structured as, as I said, but overall, uh, I don't really, I wouldn't even know how to describe it, but um, I think I have a very fast twitch brain. Like I listen to myself speak, like I listen to podcasts on 2X, right? It's just because I want to get them down, and, but I can actually understand it. And the way that I speak, when I'm on one, if I listen, I'm like, holy shit, bro, on 2X, it's too much. Like I speak really quickly think fast. Um, and I don't, yeah, I don't know. I, I, I wish I, I have. So basically the, the ADD with hyperfocus or without was the. Well, no, no ADD, ADD. Uh, a lot of times people will have that sort of scatter brain, but then they're capable of extreme focus sometimes That's for funny. long periods of time, if they are interested in the thing, but then that same person if you told them, well, you, you don't have your assistant for the day, uh, you have to uh, pay your own bills and organize all your own travel and do that, they'll be like doing everything but that thing and they'll be the most efficient, inefficient person in the, in the universe. That's me. Okay, With the second one is 100% me, the first one is 100% Phil Ivey. I'm so glad you described it that way. Because like when, when, when my guy, if I have to like, we just moved to this new house, I have to input like my new password on the Hulu to get back in drives me fucking nuts having to fill out paperwork. And I go, Oh, I don't have the patience for it. I don't want to do it. So I have other people do it. Right. Ivy has that other thing where Ivy will like, and so did Ted Forrest in a way, but like Ivy will call you and you'd be like, hello. And you're like, huh? and you're like, I'll call you back. I'm like, well, You called me. Like his brain is just like, huh? What? It's like staring at something. You know what I mean? He's doing that like that face and that look and you're like where are you bro because you're not here right now but obviously when he's playing poker he's a killer like he's intent he's super focused you know he's he's focused specifically on the task and completely just everything else and just, you know just drowns out everything else and he's so focused like that but i'm more like the other one like you said which uh yeah if it would have if i if i didn't have like someone helping me with that shit it would just it would, be, it would not get done but i don't like it it's not I would say that many poker players are characterized by the ADD with with hyper focus, and um, they also have a little bit of that OCD in in some ways, right? Uh, one way that the poker universe has changed this is nothing new to point out is you've had this like highly analytical, somewhat autistic personality that kind of dominates the high stakes where they're where they're very exacting in some ways uh d- more dominant in the pool than was the case say 15 20 years ago and yeah. i think a big reason for that though and it's a good point you bring up uh, a big reason for that is like the way in which their brains work and the way in which they study i think like the german crew that started playing was a perfect example now fedor i think is one who has natural card sense he just got that right but a lot of the guys that he was teaching or whatever did not they were not poker players. They're not card players, but they really knew how to study very well. So they worked with solvers. They studied spots. They became very analytical. Then they became very, very good, right? They didn't become good from being in that sort of Phil Ivey mindset or just figuring things out on their own. They just were really good uh, and, you know, persistent about like work ethic and, and logic in that regard. So that's what opened up for a lot of people that necessarily weren't necessarily good card players. But if you were good at study, if you went to school and university and you, you, know, you do that, you, you're very good in that practice. Now, all of a sudden with poker, you have a way to learn that way. I mean, in the old days, you couldn't learn that way. There's just, there was just no way, to, there was no way to learn it that way. Now you can. So it's interesting in that, you know, I think for online poker specifically, having that mindset is really, really important. Maybe less so when you play live and, and having, but having sort of a balance of both makes you, you know, top notch. Well, 
in the in the old situation, you couldn't shortcut the learning process where to, today you can, because what you're learning now from solvers, it is a very, very efficient way to learn. So you're able to shortcut quite a lot, whereas you weren't able to do that before. Maybe 12 years ago, you could study the databases of top players and you could shortcut a little bit that way, but it wasn't nearly- Let me example of that. The very most minimal, like very, just easiest example. Back in my day, we didn't have pre-flop charts, like shove call charts. So like if somebody went all in and you for seven big blinds and you're in the big line, there was no Nash equilibrium printout that we could like check and be like, oh, you need to call with all your, you know, with this range specifically. No, we didn't have that. So we had to just wing it, right? So a guy moves in for seven, you're like, I don't know, what the fuck does he have? Man, I don't know, do I feel like gambling with this one? I don't know. We didn't have like, because obviously those are solved spots, right? For the most part, you know, they're like someone who was in for seven big blinds from the small blind, there's a calling range, it's just correct, you know? And there's supposed to know. But we didn't know what it was. Now you can literally just give somebody that. So you've essentially one stage of the game just got completely stalled, just memorize it and you're good to go. And that was not something that was available to us, you know, back in the early 2000s. Yeah, you can pretty much date it to, uh... Bill Chin and Jared Enkinman's The Mathematics of Poker, late 2006, they came out with the push shove chart. No one had ever really seen that before. And it was it was correct. And it was ignored for a while, but it was kind of out there. In well, and when we say correct, right? Just like this old game theory thing, we have, we have to look at it like correct in a vacuum, but not necessarily just correct. Because obviously the calling ranges are, you know, Obviously, they're you know the Nash equilibrium, but that's assuming your opponent is shoving with the right range. And obviously, some ranges that people shoved with were way too tight. So if you called, you know, with this chart that says you should call with these hands, you'd be calling too often, right? And being exploited in another way. Yeah, for sure, for sure. And there and there was also the problem of, well, this is the Nash equilibrium if your only options are push fold but there are all these other options. Like you can limp the button and min raise. Right. Like they the small blind big blind stuff, right? Like under 10 bigs now, small blind, big blind, everyone knows, you know, small blind shoves pretty wide, big blind. Close. But back in our day, like the small blind was folding hands like queen eight off, just folding, right? And then that's a jam, right? We know, you know, that's, that's the plus EV jam they do, but they're folding those. So if they're folding those and you decide, oh, you know what, you know, it says here, Jack 10 is a call. I'm like, no, it is not against that guy. So even in those, you know, minutia, in those like uh, subtle spots where that are, that are solved and there's a correct and, you know, there's a right and wrong answer, that is still an area where you can exploit people based on how far they veer from, you know, their own version of what the right answer is. So you mentioned one of the things you'd do if you had a lot of time off was play some golf and have some, some golf challenges. Uh, in my research for this pod, I learned three things about you that made me realize that I don't want a golf prop bet with you. Uh, aside from our, our experience at, at TPC Summerlin, <laughs> <laughs> the, reason, <laughs> the, reasons, the reasons are um, that uh, one, Christian, who is a listener of this pod, I can, I can thankfully say, uh, he says, according to you, that you putt as well as the PGA guys when they're in town because you know the green so well and because you played snooker when you were younger and have a natural feel for things. So that's that's deterring. And uh, <laughs> you say that you shot sub-80 from the tips at TPC Summerlin, which I never would have guessed that you could do. Neither would I. <laughs> um and that was a very large bet you said 550k and you also have a full simulator in your house along with a six hole uh short game course in your backyard all true yeah well i mean listen what when christian was saying about the putting him and i as a team right because he's the one reading the greens but him and i as a team he lines it up for me but i knock him in and he knows the greens at TPC Summerlin as good as anybody. So when they come to town and play that course, you know, he feels like I can putt just as well as they can, which, you know, I don't know if it's true, but I, I haven't tested it. But 
I'm very confident in my putting game. And I think ultimately what I'm confident in is I know that if I do something like that, I'm not going to half-ass it, right? Like if you made a bet with me of some kind, like a long-term bet, like I'm going to, I'm going to work. Like when we did this thing, me and Christian, 7 a.m. we were at the golf course. You know, we practiced for an hour, played 18 holes, practiced for another hour and a half, another 18 holes. And we're eating while we play, you know? And then practice again for another hour, nine more holes, and then practice again until it got dark. So we were there 13 hours, 14 hours a day, you know, constantly working until we got there. And uh, like, I have that in me, you know? So, um, I, but I, it's fun, you know, it's fun to make those, but then they are like, that's a full-time job. You're essentially dedicating yourself to if you, if you take something like that on. Tell me your Patrick gambling stories. He was on this pod. Uh, he gave some pretty good advice to people who are listening to this pod. He said, never do one of these long-term prop bets because yeah. <laughs> They take up too much time. Yeah, no, I don't disagree. Me and Patrick, we had so much fun. Well, we had more fun than they did because we won. But um, we had we would create these scramble matches, right? Um, and I think they misjudged a few things in terms of, like, I didn't negotiate. We had a guy on our team. He would negotiate the spot. So essentially, like, the first year we did it, it was me, Christian, who's he's not a big guy. He's, like, five foot six. He's a scratch, but he hits a 280, maybe. He's not a long hitter, right? And, you know, it was two other guys, my, my friends, Asian friends. We were all decent putters. This, this was our hook. We had four guys. They had three, Patrick, their ace, Jimmy, and like another guy, right? So there was, it was them three against us. We got a T-spot, right? But we scrambled three balls against four. So on average, they'd hit the green 10, 10 yards closer than us. But we got four putts and all four of us could putt. And they had, you know, one really good putter. And then the other guys were, you know, averages, right? So we ended up winning, you know, pretty good in the first uh, year we did it. We did it again the next year. They replaced one of their guys, supposedly with a guy who isn't as long as the other guy. I'm like, okay, we'll see. The hole number 13 at TPC Summerlin is this long par five. And there's these bunkers on the left you don't mess with. It's just there's no point. He just flies it over them 380 yards. And we're like, okay, Miko, nice, <laughs> nice, nice shot. But we were still able, again, because it comes down to putting. And uh, like, I don't hit it very far off the tee. I'm like hitting it 210, but we, we really took it like the team approach. You know, I was a setup guy. I'm like, all right, I'm gonna put one out there. I'm gonna took it seriously. So that way you got one. And then you guys can go, you know, try and let her rip and stuff like that. So I embraced the role of like team player in that. And um, they were a lot of fun. Obviously there's always arguments about this after the fact, you know, you guys fucked us. We fucked you. I'm like, Hi, we thought we had an edge. You thought you had an edge, okay? That's what gambling is. Like, we went into it thinking we're going to win. You went in thinking you're going to win. And, you know, we ended up being right. And that's just the way it is. Like, that's gambling, you know? And you, you've seen, you've been around gambling enough with, with golf that, like, people just argue a lot about the spot. And they fought, some people fight hard and some don't. I remember, sidebar, my, one of my favorite stories was Shadow Creek. Me, Eric Lindgren, you know, E-Dog, remember him? He's kind of loosey-goosey with, with, we just not, the like, cutthroat like that. Phil Ivey, Doyle Brunson, you know, and a couple others. We go there to golf at 11 a.m. Boom, right? Eric says, okay, Doyle, I'll give you four. He's like, no, I need four and a half. He's like, come on, Doyle, I'm not giving you four and a half. Da, da, da. He goes four minutes. All right, he gives Doyle four and a half, you know, whatever Doyle wants. Now, Phil Ivey and Doyle Brunson are arguing their spot. We start, we're waiting to tee off at 11. It is now 3.30 p.m. <laughs> You're still not clear on, well, I can't give you this. I can't do that. He's like, fuck Doyle you ain't gonna fucking rob me no way I'm not giving you that you know you're fucking robbing us like fucking this and that and it was like and so we didn't even play like they didn't, they wouldn't even play like <laughs> they had that right like E-Dog didn't have that E-Dog had so much gamble he's like all right he would take the worst of it these guys they made it a, it was like a, they made it a point it was bloody and personal like they just they fought hard for it so whenever you match up with people and you're my favorite honestly the, my, one of my favorite was you when you, when you, because you're obviously a good golfer, but then like we make this bet on the back nine and you hit three left out of bounds, two more right out of bounds. And it's like a stroke play match. You, you bust out a 15. I'm like, all right, we got him. Like, don't, now I was just like, all right, bogey and double bogey. Just keep it in play. <laughs> no, know? I sliced the first two over the right fence on number 10. Yeah. <laughs> so Doyle has a quote where he says that, in his whole lifetime of gambling on golf, he's only met seven people that that don't choke. Does that accord with your experience? 
I started choking. Like I remember, I didn't know what it was, but they called it the golfer swing. Okay. And I was like, what is that? On hole number 17, and I was very bad at the time, you know, 17 is a part three where there's water on the left. And there's like a couple bunkers on the right, but you, you know, you just don't want to go in the water, right? Well, I went in there to hit my shot with like, don't hit it in the water, don't hit it in the water. So the water's on the left. So I hit the golf swing and I just don't even finish the swing because I'm like, I don't want it to have anything to do with the ball going that way to the left, right? So of course I still hit it in the water, you know, <laughs> even, even though I was like, desperately trying to avoid hitting the water and that's something that some people get over and most people don't like most people get the yips or they get you know under pressure when big money's on the line and like even pros like you see a lot of the pga guys like they're they're great golfers but it's different when you're golfing for prize money that you're not risking your own whereas you know you put up a hundred thousand dollars of your own money and if you screw this up you're going to lose a hundred thousand and if you can't disassociate yourself from that aspect of gambling at golf, like you end up seeing a lot of people choking. So your example of the water, I played with my friend's kid who's a top 20 golfer in the nation. And he had, he had a great, a great theory. I'm adopting this from now on. It's called the theory of don't. And the idea is that you can never have don't in your mind. You can only have, do in your mind. And the reason is that when you say don't hit it in the water on 17, your conscious registers that perfectly fine. Don't hit it in the water. That would be dumb. Uh, But your, your subconscious, when you're going to swing, it just has water. It just has water in the mind. That's brilliant (laughs) and aligned completely with the way that I see it and think about it. It's like essentially putting water out in the universe right? You're throwing it out there. And that's true. Even with putting, don't leave it short, you know, make sure you or like, you know, make sure you whatever, whatever, like, you know, your putting speed and things like that. Whenever you're thinking don't like in a bunker, you're saying like, I don't hit it over the green. Like don't skull it. Don't anytime you're thinking don't you, you, that's at the forefront of the subconscious. I believe that completely. I agree. You know, you have to say, instead of like, don't hit it in the water, say like, hit it at the flag. Right. Yeah, think do like a very particular aim spot and actually try to get it to the center of the green, right? Hit the center of the green. Try to actively crowd out thinking about water, OB, anything along those lines. I think there's so much to that that expands past just sport and gambling and golf and just life, right? Like thinking about all the things that can go wrong, thinking about all the things you're not good at instead of focusing on what you can do thinking in terms of possibility and growth and abundance rather than scarcity and, you know, negativity and stuff like that. I I think like when you see some of the more successful, you know, people in the world, they typically come from, I can do anything a lot more so than, you know, consciously being aware of all the reasons why they can't do anything. There's a saying that I like, this woman said, she says, analysis is paralysis in a lot of ways, right? Like if you said you're going to do something, then all you spend time doing is thinking about all the reasons that you can't accomplish it guess what? You're probably not even going to bother trying because you've already decided that you can't do it rather than focusing on let's do it and figure it out as we go. And those people, those kind of gung-ho people usually live outside the box. They, uh, they're go-getters, you know, and, and they find a way to, you know, to get it done. And they, they fail too, right? They fail too, but you know, sometimes they still surpass where you would have been where, because you didn't even try. Yeah. And I think it can be taught to some extent, the, theory of do if you will absolutely yeah i like practice like anything if you're consciously practicing thinking about the do rather than the don't and you consciously are doing that eventually it becomes a pattern right it becomes a habit in the no laying up podcast where you were chatting about some of your golf experiences you say that you started with a minus three million dollar downswing and this was pre-christian so you didn't really understand golf very well but you also said that you were maybe taken advantage of in negotiation at least in the in the in the early goings what years were those well listen i don't remember the years specifically but i I do remember like i remember finding it really strange that because i would tell people what i shoot right and they tell me what they shoot and like three straight rounds i play with a guy who had the best round of his life like you know, like Mike Sexton, I remember, I was like, what do you shoot? He's like, I'm a bogey golfer. Bogey is 90 for those who don't know. Well, 
Mike Sexton goes out there. He birdies number four, five, and six on his way to a smooth 75. And he says, I'll tell you what, man, that was a round of my life. So I played early on with a bunch of guys who had the round of their life. Like a lot of people who gamble at golf understand that you have a handicap, right? And you share your handicap with your opponent, and that's how you create the spot. Not a single professional poker player I was playing with had a handicap. They all told you what they shot. You know, just take my word for it. Ah, I'm about a, I'm about a, a 12, I'm about a 15, you know, whatever. And they're just comparing like their worst possible round, you know? So it just came down to like, I'd walk up to the golf course. I remember Dewey and Chipper. I even got Chip Reese out of retirement because he had a, no cartilage in his knee, but he came out because he heard I was out there playing $50,000 Nassau's. So I'd show up to the tee. I'm like, all right, what do we got? Seven, six, five. I'm like, okay, okay. I just said, yes. <laughs> I was like, okay, let's bet. And I remember once we were playing in a six sum at Shadow Creek, six sum. And I, you know, I made a double bogey. I'm like, all right, good job. You know, I was happy. I made another double, but I thought I was doing good. And Phil Ivy looks at me and was like, you're going to get fucking killed out here. Right. Like, cause we were, I was playing like the matches with everybody. You know, I'm thinking like a double is a good score. Like totally, like you said, unaware of what I would really need to be shooting to be competitive against these guys or even negotiation, getting a spot that was, you know, someone, some, something I could win at. But the biggest benefit, you know, you mentioned Christian was when I gambled before in golf as a bad, you know, new golfer, when something went wrong, I was dead, right? If all of a sudden I'm slicing it or I'm snap hooking it, or I can't, you know, I'm, I don't know, like, I don't know how to fix it, right? So that means I'm just going to like spend the rest of the 15 holes bleeding money. Cause you know, once you make a bet for an 18 holes, you play, I would just bleed money. But when I had Christian in the moment, he could be like your grip, your, your right hand, get it underneath, right? Your, you know, your stance, your, the ball's too far back. He sees everything so he can correct it and avoid like me taking like really bad bats. And obviously you're psychologically quite comfortable with him. Now, oh, yeah. uh, Dewey Tomko, you mentioned, he's in Doyle's group of seven. I don't remember where he goes over this group, but he's in Doyle's group of seven as a, non-choker this is unverified i've never played with him but <clears throat> it makes it makes sense to me if you're setting up a match with the non-choker and you're one of the non-seven settle this for the golfing universe is is choking part of the handicap choking should not be part of the handicap at all no no but that's so. not logical because that means that dewey automatically w wins if he's one of the, well, I mean, but you, you can't really fact. So for example, if you're, you know, if, if Dewey's a 10, you know, and, and you're a 10, you play even if you happen to choke, like that's on you. Like, you know, it's, it's the, he's not lying about where he's at. He's just going to shoot. Like if he says, I'm going to shoot 75 and he's got there shooting 75, then, you know, you, you match up based on what, how good you are. You can't factor in. Like, I think like you're, you're, you're just screwing up. I don't know. <laughs> I don't think you factor that in. I don't see how that could be. I don't see how that could be right. Logically, if he's one of the non chokers and your handicap is just every round where you wake up and go play and each person's a 10, then clearly well, I would say any this, outside party would bet on Dewey every time because he's but, the non choker. But, but, yeah, of course. But I would say this let's say, for example, there are two types of 10s, right? There's Dewey who's always going to shoot exact score, right? And then there's maybe you who is going to shoot much worse than that on occasions, but also have the ability to shoot much better, right? Where like, if you get hot, you'll beat Dewey, you'll beat him. But if you're not, you're going to get killed by Dewey. So, you know, if you have that type of golfer who's more erratic and across the board, like with his game, like I think when you think of non-choker, it's like, okay, if I say I'm going to shoot this number, I'm going to shoot that number. Whereas another by guy- By the way, I feel a prop bet coming on because we both know that I'm not good at golf. We well, <laughs> you're that guy, I think. Where you I'm not that really guy. Golf. I'm not that guy. Shoot, I'm not. You can I'm shoot not good. We both know I'm not good. I cannot. Not true. You can shoot 75 or 95. I can hit Over one shot. I can hit one shot that looks like I shoot 75. I cannot <laughs> shoot 75. It never, ever happens. Okay. Well, I'll take your word for it. See? <laughs> I've never played pickleball. I would play you in pickleball. Well, I'm sure. I've never played it either. And I, I would imagine that I'm drawing dead because you, you know, you have played tennis, right? I have played I have played tennis, but I've never I've never done pickleball. It looks it looks fun. Yeah. What is the most recent long-term prop bet that you've done? 
most recent you know it's been a while right because like you know we haven't been in those streets where when we were golfing every day we were doing all that sort of gambling it was pretty prevalent um since then it's just like here's the thing like money doesn't like excite me at all like to make a prop out of like ten thousand on something it just doesn't do it for me so it's been a really long time actually where i like haven't done anything like that at all i can't even think of the last time i made a prop bet really well this is more poker but you could kind of think of the fantasy poker as a as a prop bet because sure, sure oh yeah those side bets yeah that would be it then so the 25k fantasy i have a blast i've been running that event for like almost 10 years now and, you know, you pick your team and then like you're obviously gambling on that. And then you make side bets with everybody. You know, I did lay some juice in one of them because I, you know, whatever. So those that was probably the last like side bet prop bet I made was based on fantasy. And that's what I've been doing consistently every year. And your team, presumably they're picked for their endurance and, and fortitude and consistent. Well, I picked my team. So I, I went a different way. My team was very good this year. I only lost the one team. So I won a lot of money on the side bets and I came second overall. Um, I looked at the schedule, the World Series Poker schedule. So I know the point structure. I know the system. And historically, in our fantasy draft, you always want to go for like mixed game players because you get a lot of points for final tables and it's easier to make final tables when there's only 100 players versus 3,000, right? So you didn't really take no limit guys. But this year on the WSOP schedule, you got 50K, 100K, 25K, all these really big no limits. So I was like, oh, hold on. Let me go after guys like Nick Shulman. Let's go after a guy you know, who, can, who can do both, who's going to play in those high stakes ones. I, I targeted Alex Fox and I wasn't able to, to get him. But I was looking for guys that um, the crew there, mostly mixed game guys that might not realize like how valuable the no limit players have become. So, so I was thinking more along the lines of like guys that play the high roller no limits. And shortly, in a week or so, you're going to play the WSOP Europe, try to keep the, the hot streak going. What are, what are the big events going there? So I wasn't going to play. Leon sent me the schedule, and there's like, there's not all these are bracelet events. So I think like half of the ones I'm going to play are bracelet events, and the other, are, there's two 100 euro, 100K euro buy in, uh, no limits with unlimited rebuy. You got like a 25K and a 50K PLO. You got a couple 25K no limits. You got a 50K or two of, of um, no limit hold'em as well. So, you know, I plan on playing those, the main events, and, um, you know, like just grind for 10 days. I'm not going there to have any fun. Yeah, I mean, it is fun. I enjoy the product, but I'm not going there to drink and party and have fun with people. There's like, it's just solely an old school grind work trip. I love it. All right. Well, I've reached my allocation. I will, I will tell listeners that they should subscribe to Masterclass, watch, watch the course, um, follow on Twitter. Anything else? Yeah. I mean, you know, that's it. I'm real kid poker on Twitter. I got my YouTube channel for a lot of people. If you want to learn a lot of the different games, I do a series for each game, you know, how to play Deuce to seven triple trial, how to play Omaha eight or better. And it's like a 20, 30 minute course. And I'm not, I know a lot of people that have watched it that have really like, I, I remember playing with people in like a, in a tournament and they're like, they're on their phone. They're like, I'm watching your course right now. I'm like, okay, good. So now I know how you play. Great. <laughs> but yeah, check out the YouTube. We got all kinds of stuff there. You did an incredible job, by the way, on that Lex Friedman podcast. That's pretty hard when you know you're chatting with a million people and the audience is all over the map. Like that's uh, you did you did a phenomenal job there. You know, I appreciate that feedback because I've gotten a lot of the same feedback from other high roller players like Makita Bajikowski and others said, you know, saying I was doing a good job of explaining really high level concepts and game theory to you know in, in a way that's pal palpable. And I feel like I'm uniquely qualified to do that because I'm somewhat new. You know, it's only been a couple of years since I learned theory, so I understand like what's going to sound too difficult because it was difficult for me to learn at first. So just finding examples and making it more accessible to a wider audience that doesn't play. Like, I think one of the things when you have a conversation with somebody and you're talking about something that you're well nuanced on, but they might not be, you have to assume that they don't know what you're talking about. Like, you can't just assume that they understand what RFI is. What is RFI? I didn't even know till about six months ago. Oh, RFI, that's race first thin, cool, right? So it's about the lingo you use and the ways in which you try to you know, I think use examples of real life examples, but I appreciate it anyway. No, I, I enjoyed doing it. It was, it was fun. Oh, and before we say cut, I have to ask you one final question. I need you to go into your phone and scroll through your phone notes and find my name and tell me what you have. 
I'm you said in the interview that you keep you keep phone notes for every player when you're watching TV poker. You make some notes when you play hands. You make some notes. So I just need you to read off that sheet for me. Brandon Adams, watch left arm on right shoulder. And I can tell you what that means. Fingers relaxed and comfortable is strong. There you go. That was what I had on you right there. That was a little, <laughs> a little snippet. Fingers relaxed, you know, you're comfy like this, strong. Fingers like this, uh-oh, Brandon might not have it. <laughs> <laughs> Good stuff. I might yeah. have to, I'll, I'll have to review the old footage and maybe edit this part out. Now you're going to reverse it on me. <laughs> Thanks so much, Daniel. You got it, man. It was a blast.